It's nice to see you all. Uh, before I get started, how many of you have been involved in some form of an incident at your company? Raise your hand. <laughs> this should be fun. Okay, um, so really quickly, just a little bit about me. That's me. Um, I've been at a bunch of places. Um, I, the editor on my team, Brian Anderson, is the one who did the SRE book. I don't really get the credit for it. He should get the credit for it. Um, I've worked at all those companies. Before I was in tech, I like to study brains, and I think mountain bikes are the best technology ever invented. Um, okay, so why are we here? I made this thing, and we called it The Void, which is the Verica Open Incident Database. And this is like the boilerplate stuff you put it in the slides for the people who you know, want to look at it later. Um, but basically what happened is Verica was crazy and hired me um, and I was doing product research for them, and I was looking at uh, failure modes of really simple things, you know, like Kubernetes and Kafka. It's easy stuff. And I was reading other people's incidents as a way to do some of this research, and we co kept collecting more of these and collecting more of these. And I have to give a huge shout out first to Lex Neva from SRE Weekly and Dan Liu, who had a great GitHub repo, and the Kubernetes.af folks. Um, yeah, so this is not like my idea. This is not new. Other people have been doing this in some form or another beforehand. Like I said, I just managed to get hired by somebody foolish enough to let me do it full time. Um, and we realized this is really useful and valuable to us. It would be really useful and valuable to other people. And so we decided to put this thing out there last year. Um, and the goal is to really raise awareness, um, to bring a better understanding of software-based failures, um, these kinds of systems that you all run and maintain every single day. And we want to make the internet and the software that we all rely on um, more resilient and safer. Uh, and the reason for that is because we've moved on pretty rapidly from pictures of cats to running systems that support voting and healthcare and chat systems that parts of the world rely on. Software runs the world, and you all run that software. And as we all know, it works perfectly all the time, right? Yes, that is a dragon coming out of a trash bin fire starting a volcano. I don't know, it was like clip art day the other day. Um, most of them are maybe more like Calvin, though. Like, you know, there's a monster under your bed, you know there's those spooky things, and you're just waiting for the right day for them to show up. But the point is, as an industry, we're solving a lot of similar problems in our own silos. And we have like an immense body of commoditized knowledge that we could be better sharing with each other. Um, not only just what happened, but what we learn from those things. And if you're not entirely convinced of that, although I don't think I have to try very hard with this audience, there's a bit of historical precedence that I like to talk about. So back in the 1980s, 1990s in the United States, uh, our aviation industry was in a bit of a crisis. Planes were uh, not operating the way they should, and there were a lot of accidents, and their safety record was pretty abysmal. And a group of pilots, and eventually, this, as this sort of motion built, air traffic controllers and even the FAA got on board to proactively share their own incidents with each other. These are pilots for competing airlines, like, you know, so you're like, this will never work in our industry. I'm like, it might, um, and in particular, if we do it, right? And if anybody was here for Casey's talk in the morning, and he brought up the scary, spooky specter of regulation, um, but it works better if we do it, um, and we figure out what works and how we can get the most out of that. So that led to like a big, much more formalized sort of database of incidents and all of that. But it started in this really grassroots way, and it, and it worked. Um, there were other things. That wasn't the only reason. But it was a really important part of increasing the safety of those systems. Um, and so if the airline industry can learn from their incidents, so can we. Um, and so I just want to give a big shout out to Nora Jones, who is uh, the co-founder of, uh, the CEO of Jelly, the co one of the founders of what we call affectionately LFI. I think there's some LFI folks here. Um, and this is a burgeoning community that is focused on restructuring and retelling the narrative of how incidents happen and what we do when they happen and what we do after they happen. Um, and I put a link to the, to the LFI website um, up there. Okay, back to the void. So what, what is this thing? I mean, it's just basically like a database held together with tape and glue. Um, some of you might know a little bit about that. 
Um, and it, all we've done is taken publicly available incident reports. Not all of them, you can imagine, what do we have, like almost 2,000? That's nothing, right? Just getting started. A lot of these came from SRE Weekly and these other places that I already mentioned. Um, and they span from about 2008 up until, back, I don't know when I put the last one in, a couple of days ago. Um, and uh, we are collecting a variety of formats. So, so for this group, when I say incident report, you all probably have a pretty specific thing in mind. Um, you might be thinking of like, you know, a, a very detailed postmortem or something like that. But we wanted to collect a broader perspective um, and be able to do research on how society thinks about these things as well, because there's some really interesting details in there. So we have everything from social media posts to status pages, blog posts, conference talks, news articles, and yes, um, some very detailed and intricate um, reports that some of you in this audience I know um, have written. Okay, and then on top of that, we collect some metadata. Um, we collect the organization that was involved, the date of the incident, the vast majority of the time that's available, not always a couple weird things there. The date of the report itself, which can be, but is not always the same as uh, the date of the incident. The type, so I sort of mentioned this earlier, is it a primary or a secondary report? Is it something that Amy wrote um, about <laughs> their incidents? <laughs> is it something that uh, TechCrunch wrote about Twitter going down? It's all in there. Um, but we treat them a little bit differently, uh, and we just also want to be able to uh, give anybody who might be spelunking through there uh, the ability to know where these, where, these where these reports, if you will, are coming from. Okay, so here's where things get messy. Um, so we collect duration metadata if we can. Um, so status pages tend to have these, right? Now we all know that duration is a fuzzy term. Um, it has a fuzzy front end, it has a fuzzy tail end, we don't all necessarily think it means the same thing, but we do the best to take the duration information from the report itself. So like I said, status pages, usually pretty, it's, we think it started here, we say it stopped here. Sometimes you have to read a little more deeply. I've looked at almost every single one of the reports um, that's in the void um, and was one of the main coders <laughs> early on for this. And we acknowledge that duration, like I said, is messy, um, and in particular that the end of an incident uh, is not the same thing for a lot of different people. Um, so we're really talking about sort of the publicly facing end of something. We also collect metadata on the impact type. Again, super fuzzy, but what we're trying to do is lead from the language and the content within these reports. Status pages, um, if you use status.io or some of those, have their own kind of codified things, although you can get in and change them, and many of you do, <sighs> which makes it my job so much harder. But I get why. I get why you do it. Um, and these are just broad categorizations. We're not really trying to, to be able to say there were 729 you know, full production outages. This is to just help us describe and nav you know, sort of navigate the data. Um, and then we talk about analysis format, and I hope to have time to get back to this. Um, if it's noted in the report, whether you did like a root cause analysis or a contributing factors analysis, or you made up your own really fancy name analysis, we keep track of that as well. All right, so uh, a lot of what I'm telling you now is in a report that we published last fall. I'll put the link to it at the end, because um, putting it in the middle of the presentation seems silly. And you can get all of these details, and there's a whole bunch more in there. Um, but that's basically what we're looking at. So the first of the two main results from the report that I'm going to talk about is looking at those duration data. Um, and the good news is, is you're all actually pretty darn good at your jobs. Um, I don't know if you always feel that way or if the way you hear these things talked about is like that, but the, over 50% of the incidents in the void that have duration data were externally, right, we, we'll do all the hand-waving about that, resolved in under two hours. Like, you're quick. You're, you're, you're good at your jobs. That's what this tells me, right? So um, the people like you at the sharp end with the expertise that you have honed over time, you understand what you need to do, even when you don't understand how it's failing. You at least have that bench of understanding of your systems from where to start, even when things get really weird. Which, okay, now we're gonna get into the weird. So, duration data, they're messy. And Casey, in his keynote, teased that I have some kind of a secret. I don't think I actually have a secret, I think I have something that's gonna make like half of you mad. 
Um, so forgive me up front. Um, but we went and we looked at the distribution of those duration data, okay? So everybody here, like histograms, familiarity, like them, yes, okay. So we took all of those duration data and we binned them by hour, okay? So you're a one if you're in hour one, you're a zero if you're anything else, right? So we binned everything by the hours of that. So if it was under an hour, it was in the hour bin. If it was under two hours, it was in the two hour bin, right? And then you count those up. And here's our histogram. So this is the distribution of those duration data. And what I was super surprised to find is how consistent this distribution is um, and what it's not. So most notably, what you'll notice is it's all sort of off and to the left, yeah? This is what statisticians call a positively skewed distribution. Um, and that's how I can say that the majority of the incidents are resolved in an under two hours is because they're all stacked up over there. And then there's like all that weird stuff that comes afterwards, right? So let's talk about MTTR. Actually, before I do that, uh, it was so consistent that if you actually do something which really methodologically you shouldn't do, but I did it anyways, you put all the organizations together, even though they all have really different like production needs and pressures and all these things, it still looks the same. And it's not a bell curve, right? So this is the secret problem with MTTR. If you don't have a normal distribution of your data, then central tendency measures like mean, and even median, and yes, the mode, don't represent your data accurately. So when you think you're saying something about the reliability, I can never get this word right, reliability of your systems, you're using an unreliable metric. And that sucks. Um, so, but let me get into it. So when I saw this, I was like, I've seen, I've seen this somewhere before. And earlier last year, an engineer from Google by the name of Stefan Davidovich decided to go looking into this as well. Um, and he published this really amazing report. Um, I didn't put the link to it here, so I feel bad about that. I'll add that when I get the slides. Um, it's called Incident Metrics in SRE. It's like something, something, MTR and Friends. He found the exact same distributions um, and had done basically what, what we'd done. He'd gone and collected public incident reports for three very large public companies um, and for Google. He doesn't show you all the Google data because, you know, Google. Um, but very similar positive skewed distributions. So I was like, okay. And then what he did was really interesting. So you, he's sitting on all of these data and he said, okay, let's do a thought experiment. We want to be able to tell, like, is our reliability getting better, right? If we use this as a proxy metric for our reliability. So let's make a magical product that will make our reliability, like, make our incidents faster, right? We're going to resolve them more quickly. Poof. Magical product. He takes all the data and he runs a, mon a big series of Monte Carlo experiments. Um, raise a hand on people who know what Monte Carlo experiments are. Okay. Um, think of them as, like, A-B tests. Right? Where you have some data, you do something to, and some other data, but it's not like your production data coming in off of your site. He just took the data he already had, and he took a set, and he left them alone, and he took a set, and he made them 15% faster. Cool? And then you ran a bunch of simulations of all of that across all these data to see, can I detect that change in MTTR? Okay. And this, this is where it like, gets a little bit gnarly, and I always have to look at my notes to make sure I don't say this wrong. <laughs> so, because um, I can't remember the numbers perfectly. So even though in his simulation the improvement was implied every single time, 38% of the simulations had the MTTR difference fall below zero for company A, 40% for company B, and 20% for company C. Um, and you kind of see the, the graphs are, it's, I, I had a hard time when I first looked at these understanding that, had to spend some time knowing, but a positive change in incident duration is, um, means like an improvement or a shortening. So you're shortening the time, but you have a positive value. It's, I found it a little confusing until I spent some time with it. What this really means is the probability of seeing at least a 15 minute improvement is 49% to 50%. Like, good luck, <laughs> flip a coin, you don't know. And when I saw this, I was just like, oh my God, this is, this is, this is a problem. Um, and so what, this means is that distributions of data like this don't, you can't use MTTR. Don't get mad at me. Um, and, and so 
I, I really urge you all, I think they're gonna look the same, right? Like every company I have in the void looks like that. You might, you might be different, but if you're not different than Google, well, we're all a little different than Google. Um, okay, before you like really hate me, you're like, okay, well, wait a minute. No, really, like it just feels right. Longer incidents are worse, right? It gotta be, feels, it makes sense. Uh, I can't help you there. Um, but I'm starting to run some broader analysis on this. This is Honeycomb's status page data for just a little slice of time. Um, I hope you all can see this, and I apologize. They are color-coded, so it's not the most accessibly friendly thing, but we tried to make patterns, which I realize you literally can't probably see, but in the report. Um, so things that are red were coded as really, really bad um, on the status page for Honeycomb. Things that were green were like, eh, it's really not a big deal. Um, we're just gonna, you know, no one's screaming at us, it'll be okay. Um, and then in between, you can imagine sort of colors of blue and, and orange. Um, and the, the length in this, in what you see here just intuitively is there's not really a relationship. But I wasn't sure of that, so I've started running some actual correlational analyses on these data, on status page uh, data, and I'm finding actual statistical evidence of that as well. So uh, teaser, that's gonna be in the next void report. Um, when we hopefully show across a larger corpus of these that there's no relationship between the self-reported severity of an incident and the duration of that incident. One caveat, long incidents are worse for you. So when I say worse, I don't mean necessarily that it's like, no, it's fine. It just means like externally to your customers, are they really, is it something you would say, this is really bad and it's on fire, or it's like, okay, we can fix this and no one's gonna scream at us all night. Okay, so uh, these are what John Alspa calls shallow data. I don't know if anybody has um, heard of that guy um, or read any of his blog posts. Um, we have an example of this in the report, but um, you can have a chess game that's the exact same duration but has very different levels of expertise um, and, and the kinds of moves that are involved. You can have low production and high production budget movies that win or don't win awards and have different you get my point, you can have a metaphor for this. Um, but it's hard, these, these metrics are appealing because they appear to make clear, concise, like concrete sense of what are really messy, surprising situations that don't lend themselves um, to simple summaries. And uh, the, this exact same set of like technical circumstances for you or for you or within your own organization um, could be very different depending on who's responding, what they know or don't know, like your risk appetite, like all kinds of things, what the pressures were that day, who'd had enough sleep. Um, so MTTR, it's not good. I mean, um, <laughs> don't panic, um, but the answer is that it's, it's just gonna be harder. We all love that, right, um, for an answer. Um, but here's the deal. Your systems are socio-technical systems, right? They comprise people and computers and how they work together and the software that we as people write and the systems that we exist in and the political pressures and the production pressures and the financial pressures. We as humans are building these systems and when we are maintaining them, but we've just been collecting technical data, which some of which turn out to be like not very useful. So my argument, which echoes a lot of what Casey said this morning, is that if you have a socio-technical system, you need to collect socio-technical data. Um, some of these are more technical than others. I don't have a ton of time to go into this. There's more of this in the report. Um, things like SLOs that should at least reflect like what's happening in theory with your customers um, or customer feedback, um, that's a harder one. And I think Stefan's gonna be writing some more stuff about this, which will be exciting to see um, if that comes out. Tracking how many people and tools are involved in your incidents. This, is, this one is, has a nice number. You can put a number on a slide. You can track this number. Um, I don't know what the, like, what the distribution of these will be because not enough people are collecting this yet. Um, and I like to refer to this as the cost of coordination, which is also not my idea. It's Dr. Laura McGuire's idea. Um, she wrote her PhD thesis on it, and I've put the citation down to that. She's a researcher at Jelly, um, one of the lead authors behind their Howie um, guide, which I talk about in this next section. Um, but things like how many people across how many teams, across how many tools, that tells you a lot more about the impact that that incident has on your organization and on your people. Um, 
So I think that's an incredibly valuable one, and I'm just barely starting to see some people, I don't know if you collect it, I'm barely seeing anybody actually like publishing that. So we'd love to see more of that. Focus on themes and narratives as you analyze your incidents and you build them up. Um, that's a whole other talk that someone from Jelly should give, and not me, um, and I'm sure they will do more of that. They have an excellent guide that I mentioned, Howie, and they have a really, really good series of blog posts on their website right now that delve well into the world of sort of incident analysis, all of that. And they are, in my opinion, the de facto experts on that, so go check them out. Okay, so fourth thing is to study near misses. Um, and I bring this up, again, because back to our aviation friends. That was an area that they actually honed in on and focused on um, because they found it to be such a rich source of information about their socio-technical systems. And we have less than 1% of reports in the void currently that are what we would consider near misses. The definition of that at this point is that the organization determined that there was no impact on the customers, but almost, right? So they averted a near disaster, which is actually a success. And you can learn a lot from studying your successes. Um, so uh, there's, this is a wonderful book called Close Calls, um, and the author goes on to a lot of detail about how the airline industry and the aviation industry learned a lot more about their systems from studying near misses. Um, Carl McRae, I just wanna make sure that I got um, his name right. They provide, I'm gonna quote him just because I like it, the source materials to interrogate the unknown test current assumptions, invalidate expectations, become aware of ignorance, and undergo experience. And he was talking about planes. And I know we're building software and software's not planes. But that could apply, those statements could apply just as much to us. Um, near misses also, I think, do a really great job of highlighting where you people come in and where you provide your sort of expertise and adaptive capacity to prevent disaster. And they, they really get at that socio-technical kind of thing. Um, and everyone I've talked to about these, there's a couple of companies that are really invested in studying their near misses. Um, I'm gonna skip that, because that's just gonna take too long. Um, Honeycomb is one of them. Um, I've met with a bunch of the engineers from the Reddit team who lived through the Wall Street's bet fun. Um, <laughs> are anybody of you here? That would be great. Um, and then someone who wrote up this really great um, near miss, the console outage that uh, never happened. Um, at MailChimp, and they highlight these things because there's so much less pressure, right, on you and the team and the organization. Nothing failed, there's no one to, you know, we can get into blame and <laughs> at the end here. Um, and in, in, in sort of removing that pressure, it gives people this breathing room and this space to go, oh, okay, wow, it was, so, you know, was it the monitoring thing, or what was the team doing that day, or who was the team that built this, you know, all the kind of stuff. And, Way past five Ys, too, right? We're not, this is not that. This is like really understanding how your organization is structured in ways that um, lead to these types of situations. So study your near misses. Um, they're harder to identify. They take a lot of time. Um, but I would argue the ROI on those is going to be pretty darn high. OK. I want to make sure I get time to questions at the end. Casey did also talk a little bit about root cause. Um, I was convinced that this would be a bigger number, but we decided to look and see how many people are either doing an official root cause analysis, like an RCA, or saying that they found an explicit root cause. Um, and that ended up being only about a quarter of the reports that we have in the void. And to be honest, it's mostly Microsoft and Google. I'm not throwing shade, by the way, when I say that. It just means like two large organizations that do this as a practice, and the rest of us look up to them, right? So I wanted to see if this changes over time or not. Um, and Casey kind of hinted at the root cause um, side of the house earlier, and I don't have enough time to really get into it. I talked to it a lot more in the report. Um, but we want to track root cause because language matters in a socio-technical system. The way we talk about our systems influences the way we think and deal with those systems. And so if we speak about those systems like there is a single root cause to the shenanigans that you all see on a daily basis, then we're stopping short of really starting to understand that like really broad socio-technical thing. And also, root causes are almost always technical unless they're a person. And that's the second part of why we want to study this and why I have concerns about it for the industry because I really think that it can lay a path to blame. Um, it's really easy, like Casey said, to just like, kind of narrow the point down on top of the people at the sharp end of the stick. 
Um, and, and it's a requisite Richard Cook quote, because I like that man. Um, and he says really smart things. Um, so <laughs> I'm speeding up at the end, which is like definitely one of my uh, things. So I'm going to skip. We get that one. Um, I really do call this like the matrix moment for people, though. You know, when you're like, oh, God, OK. Cool, cool. Um, and then you know you have to go back and absorb that and try to figure out how to bring that into your organization, which hopefully some of Casey's talk helped with. But so what I'm arguing is we need a new approach. We need a new mindset. We need a new tool set or some new tool sets. We need new skill sets for talking about analyzing, learning from, and sharing our incidents. Um, and especially on the skill set side, uh, I think I bring this up in in the report. Um, but. Uh, some companies are starting to hire incident analysts like as dedicated roles, um, because it turns out that like analyzing an incident is not actually the same thing as handling an incident or building the systems that are involved in those incidents. Um, and a lot of it has to do with some of these like socio-technical kinds of systems, right? And these are people who have a different set of skills. They're still technical, but they're also really good at interviewing people and putting together narratives and finding themes and doing all of these kinds of organization of that kind of material over time. So the new approach I'm advocating for is for us to treat our incidents as opportunities to learn um, and not to punish or blame or feel stupid or silly, uh, to favor in-depth analysis over shallow metrics, to treat you all, the people who run these systems, as solutions, not problems, and to study what goes right along with what goes wrong. Oh, I did write that right. OK, cool. Um, so you can download the void report from last year at this URL here. And I think that's it.